Hey, welcome back to the Horsepower Monster. Now my 1980 Corvette build project is nowhere close to being ready for an engine yet, but I just couldn't help myself. This is what I'm calling the Enfuego 60, and it's got a little bit of a history. Several years ago, I was writing for Chevy High Performance Magazine, and I pulled this engine out of a Cadillac Escalade in a junkyard that had been on fire. Now the fire wasn't bad, it had melted some plastic, but there was fire extinguisher dust everywhere. So we called this the Enfuego 60. The idea was to build it for dyno testing, but unfortunately Chevy High Performance went under before we got very far, and so it just kind of got pushed into a corner. So finally I figured, hey, let's dig this out. We'll build this, actually we'll overbuild this into something that's way too much than the Corvette can handle, but you know what they say, overkill is underrated. Let's have some fun with this thing. Before I got hold of it, the old Enfuego 60 must have lived a pretty hard life. This is how I found it in the junkyard, dressed out as a 345 horsepower 6 liter LQ9 in a 2005 Cadillac Escalade. Now judging from the excessive amounts of what looked to be fire extinguisher powder and the lack of body damage, I could only assume an engine fire had sent it to its final retirement. Honestly. It was a terrible choice for a donor motor, but something appealed to me about going with the worst option that other people were turning their noses up at and building a great engine out of it. So I conned my dad into tagging along to help me and we set about ripping into the Escalade. Unfortunately, it only got worse the further we went. Not only had the engine been on fire, there was also extensive water damage. It seemed like every bolt was rusted solid. What should have been done by lunch ended up taking a little over a day, but we finally got it out and home to my shop for teardown. As you can see, there was corrosion everywhere. And I mean everywhere. The rot was so bad in the cylinder bores, I finally had to give up on the idea of a civilized disassembly and just beat the pistons out like a caveman. This is what was left of them when I was finally done. Obviously, after going all nuclear on the pistons and rods, I knew they'd be unusable. But there was still so much damage to the things like the lifters and the crankshaft from corrosion that there really wasn't much use trying to refurbish anything. I guess I could have salvaged the cylinder heads, but I ended up punting on the entire idea and ended up keeping only the block as well as the front and rear covers. Actually, I hoped that I'd be able to keep the block. As you can see, the cylinder bores are pretty corroded. So I took it to my friends, Keith and Jeff Dorton at Automotive Specialist to see if the block would machine up. <laughs> I have brought you a present you do not want. All right. <laughs> Turns out the block was salvageable, but just barely. The bores had to be machined out from the stock four inches in diameter all the way to four inches 70 thousandths which is just about as far as you absolutely want to go with the bores on a stock block. So since we had to start over, I figured we might as well go big. You know, that whole overkill thing. K1 and Wiseco have a stroker rotating assembly kit that's really quality. So I went with that to start. The crank bumps the stroke up from the stock three inches, 622 thousandths, all the way to an even four. So, along with the 4 inch 70 thousandths bore, that'll make total displacement 416 cubic inches. Not too bad. But if you're into metric, let me try to speak it in your language. Oi, mate, that'll be 6.8 liters. God, that was bad. I'm sorry. Forgive me. So anyhow, step one is to get the new rotating assembly balanced up. Automotive specialist Justin Bryson handled this one. Justin balanced the crank by cutting the counterweights on a lathe and then finishing up with a hand grinder. It takes more time than the usual method of drilling holes in the counterweight, but those holes can cause windage. Now, my engine isn't one that really needs this level of excess, but cutting corners just isn't something they do here. And that was basically as far as we got before Chevy High was killed off. We had the bearings fitted and the crank bolted into place when I learned the magazine was kaput. So the engine basically got bagged up and pushed into a corner where it sat for the last few years. 
But now I've decided to revive it for my Corvette. So I've pulled it back out of storage where I left it at Automotive Specialist, sprayed on a coat of paint, and now I'm ready to get back to the build. The crank is already where it needs to be. And as you can see, we've also swapped out the main cap fasteners for much higher quality main studs from ARP. This, by the way, is a Gen 3 motor, so the new K1 crank has the 24X reluctor wheel. And now I just need to hang some pistons on the rods. So now we've talked about stuffing that four inch crank in here, which is gonna help us get a lot of cubic inches out of this. And we've also opened up the bores to four inch 70 thousandths. So total displacement is now gonna be 416 cubic inches. So now the question becomes, how do we stuff all those cubic inches in there safely so the engine lives a long and happy life? So for that, we've got a combo of six inch 125 thousandths connecting rods from K1 and our Weissco pistons. Our limiting factor is the deck height on the LS, which is nine inches, 235 thousandths. So to get all that in there, we're using a piston with a real small compression height. That's just an inch, 110 thousandths. That eats up into our lower oil ring rail. So we'll have to use a support rail to help hold that up, but it's all gonna work out great. Oil ring support rails are nothing new, but for me, the problem is the wrist pin bore is now up into the bottom of the oil ring land. That means you can't center the spiral lock over the groove in the bore when you're installing them. And that can make it really difficult to open up the spiral locks enough to get them into place without stretching them out too much and screwing up the tension. I tell you that as a reason to show you this cool invention from some friends of mine called the lock-in tool. Now, I don't get anything out of this. I actually paid cold hard cash for this one. It's just a unique tool that comes in really handy. Instead of trying to work a spiral lock in by hand or with a screwdriver and praying the whole time you don't bend one and ruin it, you just spin the spiral lock onto the groove of the tool until it's level with this mark, then press the end of the tool into the pin bore on a bit of an angle until the end of the lock settles into the groove of the pin bore, and then rotate the tool counterclockwise to gently press the rest of the spiral lock into its receiver groove. Now I know that there are a lot of experienced engine builders that can install spiral locks in their sleep, but I'm not one of them. And this tool just works. So I can get the locks in with minimal frustration, no bent and ruined spiral locks, and most important, I'm confident that each one is properly seated into the receiver groove and won't be going anywhere after the engine is assembled. If this looks interesting to you, I'll leave a link to the lock-in tool in the description for this video. Again, I don't get anything out of it. It's just a couple of good guys that came up with a great idea and are trying to machine and sell the tool on their own. Once the pistons are on the rods, the ring pack can go on. First up are the oil ring support rails. Each rail has a bump that should be pointed toward the bottom and locates in the pin bore gap. Once the oil rail is also installed, that bump keeps the support rail from rotating. This is Weissco's GFX ring pack. They are an 043, 043, three millimeter ring set. The top ring is gas nitride steel, while the second is phosphate coated cast iron. And then the oil ring is stainless steel. I've already gapped them to 20 thousandths for the top ring and 22 thousandths for the second. And here's a better look at how the oil ring rides on the support rail as it crosses over the intrusion of the pin bore into the ring land. As you can probably tell, the Dortons were kind enough to allow me to assemble this engine in their shop. Keith was waiting on some parts to arrive on the old big brown truck for his own build he was working on. So since he had a break, he stepped in to help punch in the pistons for me while I ran the camera. Then, once the pistons and rods are all in the block, 80 foot-pounds of torque on the cap screws gives the proper four and a half thousandths of an inch of stretch. The camshaft is a hydraulic roller ground for us by comp cams. 
Now this engine is not a dyno queen. I really wanted to make the Corvette a blast to drive. So I asked for a grind that would maximize power across the RPM range and be drivable in town as well as on a track. And I think the guys at Comp really delivered on a great combo. The duration on the cam they came up with is healthy, but not ridiculous. It has 247 degrees of duration at 50 thousandths lift for the intakes and 255 degrees for the exhaust. That's with a 113 degree lobe separation on a 110 degree center line. And with 1.7 to 1 ratio rocker arms, gross valve lift will be 637 thousandths for both the intakes and the exhaust. After bolting up a new cam retainer plate, the Comp Cam's high tech race roller timing set goes into place so we can degree in the cam. This is a single row chain, which means we won't need spacers for the oil pump, but the chain is pre-stretched and extremely strong so it can handle all the abuse we can give it. Once Keith okays the cam timing is correct, the Melling oil pump is ready to go on. Melling says you can loosely bolt up the oil pump, then rotate the crankshaft over a couple times to center the gear odor lobes and then bolt the pump down tight. But a new engine is an expensive piece of machinery. So I prefer to take the extra time and shim the lobes just to make doubly sure the pump is properly centered around the crank snout. And then what's cool with the melling pump is they do include extra springs depending on the oil pressure target you want to run. We bumped it up one level to what melling calls their Copo Camaro spring. Next up comes the front drive. I didn't want to mix and match a bunch of different components, but I also had a bit of trouble finding a kit that I was certain would fit the Corvette. After all, the C3 from the 70s and 80s isn't exactly the most popular build project. The problem is nothing can be situated very low at all in front of the block or it'll hit the upper control arm mount. But Holly actually posts the critical dimensions for its front accessory drive kits right on their website. I was able to print them off, take them out to the shop, and determine that their mid-mount accessory drive kit will fit my chassis no problem. Hey, pretty cool if you ask me. Anyhow, the key to how they've been able to come up with such a compact accessory drive setup is this water pump casting that integrates all the mounts for the alternator, power steering pump, and even the AC compressor there are no brackets, linkages, or anything. Just one tensioner for the serpentine belt, and the result is a very compact, sanitary setup. I'm definitely cool with an intake, or maybe even someday a turbo sticking out of the hood, but nobody wants to see an alternator way up high in the air. There's a ton of cool details with this kit, but I think the most important to you and me is that Holly is smart enough to include an upgraded performance alternator made to handle RPMs 30% higher than a stock unit. So if you take your car to the drag strip or autocross and really wind the engine out, the alternator isn't going to burn up on you and puke its guts out. I'm kind of jumping around a little bit here, but let's turn our attention back to the valve train. You'll remember we've already installed a hydraulic roller camshaft from Comp Cams. Mating to that are a set of Comp's new Evolution Hydraulic Roller Lifters. These unique lifters have a hydraulic cartridge inside the thick-walled lifter body that uses less oil and is supposed to be more consistent in terms of bleed-down rates and performance over other hydraulic lifters you can find. They are a direct fit in my stock block, so I thought they were definitely worth trying out. The lifters were left to soak in motor oil while I went to lunch, and then they just dropped right into the bores. I definitely could have been a little more careful and not made as much of a mess here, but hey, it cleans up. And then after making sure the flats on the top edge of the lifters are correctly aligned, I installed a new set of lifter trays. Maybe I could have reused the original ones, but they were so old I was concerned that the plastic material they were made from may have gotten a little bit brittle. So I got a new set from Summit Racing. 
The new MLS gaskets are from Felpro, and finally, we're ready for some cylinder heads. Okay, so now the short block, plus some of the front drive is done because I was skipping around and waiting on parts, but now we're ready for some fun stuff. Early on, we decided to make this build part of a test for a Phytech system for the LSs, and so we're using this awesome intake manifold. And as you can tell, it's Cathedral Port for the LS1, which only makes sense. This was a 2005 engine, but, this kit, and I'll show you more of it in a second, can handle up to 750 horsepower. So we had to make sure we had heads that can handle the power. That's why I called up my friends at Brodix and they sent over their new 13 and a half degree series fully ported cylinder heads. Now these are really tricked. 70 cc chambers to help keep my compression down, 245 cc intake ports, and everything is CNC cut. Best of all, with the two inch 100,000s intake valves and the inch 600 exhaust, this head, because it's fully CNC ported, can flow over 370 CFM through the intakes and 235 through the exhaust. And this is really cool because a lot of times guys will tell you if you want to make power with an LS, you got to go with the square port intakes. But it's really not true. People like Brodix are still developing the Cathedral port. In fact, this is a brand new port design they've just come out with. So if you've got an early LS1 and you've got your cathedral port intake manifold, you don't want to throw everything away, but you want to upgrade the heads, you can go with something like this with the cathedral port intakes and really boost the power in your ride. We're going to see what it can do. Although the heads arrive complete with stainless valves and really nice valve springs, Jeff Dorton recommended we pull them down for inspection. Now everything turned out great, but it did give us a chance to run the springs through the checker. We found the spring pressure to be 167 pounds on the seat and 390 fully open at 637th valve lift. Now that's a bit high for typical street hydraulic lifters, but the tech staff at Comp Cams assured us that their evolution lifters are more than happy under that pressure, so we went with it. The valve springs are high quality components and I didn't really want to replace them anyway. Oh, and with that 70 cc chamber, the compression ratio will be 9.99 to 1. Hey, might as well just call it 10. So I reassembled the freshly cleaned Brodix heads and set them in position. They are secured to the block with a stud kit from ARP. They've had these for a little bit now, but you may not be aware that ARP has started putting a texture on one side of their head stud washers. Now this textured side goes against the head and it grips it to keep the washer from spinning. And the result is more consistent fastener stretch when the nuts are torqued into place. Once all 15 fasteners are in place on each head, the 10 nuts on the 11 millimeter main studs are torqued to 80 foot pounds in each stages and then the five upper eight millimeter studs are torqued to 28. This is the stock valley cover for the Gen 3 LS engine. It's easily recognizable by those two big old cavities for the stock knock sensors. The Phytech ECU I plan to use for this build, which you'll see soon, can work with knock sensors, but my understanding is the stock knock sensors are pretty highly tuned for the stock engine configuration. And the more you change the engine, the more the knock sensors can struggle to separate real honest engine knock from actual horsepower. So I'm ditching not only the knock sensors, but also this ugly cover for a billet aluminum unit from ICT Billet. Besides just looking worlds better than the stock junk, the ICT Billet Valley cover is smooth, so it won't trap damaging dirt moisture and road grime like the stock unit will. Next up, we can finish the valve train. Although we're not going to be using the stock style rockers, the stock rocker bar does go down next. The only problem is the rocker pad for the Brodick cylinder heads is not the same shape as the stock heads. So there are these little tabs on the underside of the rocker bar that don't fit anymore. So those had to be just ground off. I didn't get any video of me doing that, but here's the finished product. The rocker bolts will locate the rockers and the rocker bar, so I'm not worried about removing the tabs. 
And then here comes our really cool rocker setup. This is CompCam's Max Lift BSR shaft rocker system. Now this design puts all eight rockers on each side on one big shaft. These rockers are a standard body style, which helps keep the cost down, but they are brushed so there's no worries about needle bearing issues. And Comp says that the single shaft design, while it will bolt right up to a stock cylinder head, significantly improves valve train stiffness and reduces rocker arm deflection when using stronger valve springs like we are, or when running higher RPMs like we hope to do. Deflection, as you're probably aware, is a horsepower killer because rocker flex causes the camshaft to act smaller than it actually is. We worked hard with the guys at Comp to come up with what we feel like is the perfect cam grind for this engine application. So we definitely want to get every ounce of power out of this cam that we can. Hopefully, these really trick shaft rockers will help us get there. And while I could have gone with the stock valve covers, they're just so dang ugly and everything else in here is looking sweet. So I went with a set of Holly's cast valve covers. They definitely clean up the look and I love the billet oil fill cap. Plus they're also designed to eliminate the coil pack bracket. The eight coils will bolt directly to the valve covers, which certainly helps clean up the top of the engine. Now from here on out, you're going to hear the words Phytech mentioned a lot. That's because I'm working on an article for All Chevy Performance Magazine about Phytech's Ultimate LS Top End Kits. And I figured this engine would be the perfect place to put one of their kits to the test. This particular kit includes Phytech's Long Runner Intake Manifold, a 102 millimeter throttle body, a touchscreen controller, eight coils, two wideband O2 sensors, a custom built wiring harness, fuel pump, fuel rails, a self-learning ECU, 55 pound per hour injectors, and a fuel pressure regulator, along with a lot of other odds and ends not shown here. The only thing they offer that I'm missing is the integrated transmission control unit. At first glance, this really does look like a great kit, but we all know the proof is in the pudding and we'll find out on the dyno. Also, I wrote an entire article for All Chevy Performance just on this kit with a ton of details and I don't have time to include all that again here. Once All Chevy Performance puts it up online, I'll add a link to that article in the description for this video. There's no doubt that the fabricated aluminum intake is the biggest piece of eye candy in Phytech's Ultimate LS kit. And if you can't tell from the video, the black anodizing is gorgeous. If you want to keep everything stuffed underneath your hood, Phytech also offers a short runner intake that stands at just six and a half inches tall. But if you ask me, where's the fun in that? There's no doubt that this long runner intake will stick out of the hood of the Corvette, but I'm totally cool with that. This Corvette is going to be an abomination to the old numbers matching fuddy duddies anyway. So we might as well go big. Oh, and you can get these in either a cathedral port intake runner or a square runner for the LS3 style engines. And before I bolt up the throttle body, here's a look at the plenum area of the intake. Overall, the plenum seems a bit small for all our cubic inches, but Phytech says this kit is designed to handle up to 750 horsepower, so we'll see. I do like that the intake runners are bell-mouthed inside the plenum to help smooth the airflow pattern through the runner. Phytech includes several of the sensors you're going to need, including a three-bar map sensor. I do like that it mounts up in the back, making it easier to reach than underneath the intake, but still out of sight. And since the map sensor can handle 30 pounds of boost, I assume that means the intake should be able to handle it too. If we ever get a wild hair and decide to add a turbo, that'll be nice. That metal plate is Phytech's throttle mounting bracket, which must be ordered separately, but is definitely nice to have. The 750 horsepower kit 
Includes a 102 millimeter throttle body, but if you order a 500 horsepower kit, like for a 5.3 or a 4.8 build, it'll come with a 92 millimeter intake. Regardless, the idle air control valve and throttle position sensor are included and actually arrive already installed on the throttle body. The fuel rails are built aluminum with the same nice black anodizing. And I appreciate that the hose ends arrive already installed on the wire braided crossover line. The injectors are branded Phytec. I assume they're private labeled from somewhere, but I can't tell who made them. These are 55 pound per hour injectors, but if you get the 500 horsepower kit, Phytec swaps out the injectors for a set that flows 36 pounds per hour to better match the engine's needs. Well, it's a new day, but it's D-Day, otherwise known as Dino Day. She's looking pretty good, isn't she? There's no way this tall intake manifold is going to fit underneath the hood of the Corvette, but I kind of like that. Just a few more things left to do. Namely, I've got to bolt on the Phytec coils to these highly cast valve covers, route up the plug wires and the plugs, and I think we'll be ready to head to the dyno where we can sing you the song of my people. And so the process of mounting the engine up on the dyno begins. As you can see, Justin Bryson has stepped back in. He handles fitting up the engines on the dyno at Automotive Specialists. So I'm just back in my natural role as glorified helper. And then once we had all the mechanicals finished up, Jeff Dorton, who among his many roles is the tuning specialist at the shop, stepped in to help button up the electronics. All the plugs on the wiring harness are clearly labeled, which is definitely helpful. One interesting choice with the Phytec kit, however, is it doesn't monitor oil pressure. There's no hookup for the oil pressure sensor, so you'll need to mount up your own gauge for that. On the dyno, you just kind of have to hang things where you can, but the self-learning ECU, as well as the fuse box, both seem to have enough lead to allow you to mount them on either the firewall or even in the glove box when you're actually installing everything in your car or truck. This is the touchscreen controller. As you can see, it has a nice color screen. And as I mentioned, it's a touchscreen but there's also physical buttons if you prefer that. We use the controller to set up and tune the engine exclusively on the dyno. Even though Phytec says if you want, you can hook the ECU up to a laptop. You can use the handheld controller to dial in timing, fuel maps, idle RPM, the RPM limiter, and a ton of other stuff. Here, we're going through the setup process. Notice that we typoed the engine displacement and need to go back and update it to 416 cubic inches. But the setup is literally that easy. Then we fired it up and let the self-learning ECU basically take over while we ran the engine through a break-in and got ready to make some pulls in anger. Okay, it's dyno time. The fun is starting, and I gotta admit, I'm also a little bit nervous. But one thing that we did notice, the engine fired up and it did great, but it was having a problem cooling and moving water through. Part of it is just the setup of this dyno. The outlet is here, the water's gotta come all the way up to here and that way. And while we're still at low RPMs during break-in and everything, the water pump isn't made to be able to push it that high. So we've taken off the belt and we're using an electric water pump for now. Once the engine is at higher RPMs, it can push it up the hill fine, but this is a situation it'll never see in a car anyway. So that's just so you know. If you think it's cheating to not run the water pump during a dyno pull, then feel free to knock about three or four horsepower off the peak number. But 
We're also not running any velocity stack or any sort of bell mouth over the throttle body, which would also help us make power. So I figure it balances out. Oh, and check this out. The Fisec coils have LEDs on them. They are in the circuitry to the spark plug, so every time the coil sends juice to its plug, the LED also lights up. Yeah, it looks cool, but the real advantage here is if your engine is ever running rough, you don't have to guess if you have a bad coil. All you need to do is make a quick visual check. Also, the handheld controller isn't meant to be used as a full-time gauge panel, but it does allow you to choose a couple gauges to go along with RPM and an air fuel ratio meter for both your actual and target ratios. I gotta admit, I do like being able to watch the air fuel ratios whenever I want. Anyhow, enough talk. Let's make some pulls. Gotta admit, I was both excited and frustrated by the results. The engine pulled hard from the start of the pull at 4,500 RPM all the way through 7,300. In fact, it averaged 386.4 foot-pounds of torque and 486.4 horsepower throughout the range. And we had peaks of 521.2 foot-pounds of torque at 5,300 RPM, which is great, and 597.3 horsepower at 6,700 RPM, which is uh, fine, I guess. No matter what, the engine just didn't want to break the 600 mark when it came to horsepower. Granted, the cam is not too radical, and this is a 10 to 1 motor burning pump gas, but I just felt at 416 cubic inches, it should be able to peak somewhere over the 600 mark. Now, we could have fudged the correction factors on the dyno and sort of cheated to get the number up over the 600 mark, but neither Jeff Dorton nor I are into that cheesy stuff like that. You can trust, no matter what, I ain't lying to you. I do, however, think the Phytech Ultimate LS kit is a really good option for anyone looking to do an LSX engine swap into a car or truck because it includes the ECU, the wiring harness, the fuel pump, and just about everything else you need to get an LS up and running in a chassis that was never meant for it. This engine is going to be an absolute blast once it's in the Corvette. Even though we did not break that 600 mark, it's way more power than the car's gonna be able to handle unless I make some pretty significant changes to the suspension. So, I think it's gonna be fantastically fun ripping around on the street or maybe the autocross or something like that. But I've got one more thing I wanna do. I got these plates from ICT Billet that allow me to put a small block engine mount on an LS. Super simple, super trick, super strong. So I wanna be able to put it in the chassis just to see how it looks. I know, it's kind of janky to set the intake manifold on top when you still have the engine lift plate bolted to the block. But I just wanted to see what it looks like. And best of all, it looks like this Holly mid-mount accessory drive will fit no problems. And if you look on the bottom left, you can see where a lot of people mount the AC compressor just won't fit in this application. 
I'm really excited to have the engine ready for this build. It gets me even more motivated to finish up everything else to get it on the road. Hey, thanks again for watching the Horsepower Monster and check back in soon for more great videos.